address myself today. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. You know, it's everything communicates, right? Everything. And we all sang about an unclouded day, did we not? So I decided to put a little visual uh, to go with it. And I don't know what you're praying for today, but maybe among that, uh, those requests that we make of the Lord, you will say, Lord, don't ever let me dress like Andy or Kelly Riley. <laughs> oh, stop it. Stop it. We are good friends here. It's great to have you. If you don't know me, my name's Andy. I'm one of the pastors here at Munger. And it's really cool to have you with us this morning. So thanks for being here. Our, our scripture, we've been going through the gospel of Matthew. And actually, if you've been doing this with us, you should be good enough now to read this story that we're about to read and decode it. So the meaning should speak to you at at least two levels in the sense that we're going to read the transfiguration. That's what the, that's what the, the church calls this scripture is the transfiguration of Jesus. And in addition to that, if you've been reading Matthew from the beginning, you should be able to see some words and phrases that unlock a deeper meaning to the story. So let's look at it together. Hopefully we'll touch on both of those, but if we could, this is Matthew 17. It is the transfiguration of Jesus. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, it is good, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. The transfiguration of Christ, according to the Gospel of Matthew, many of the church patristics, the church fathers, early theologians said this along with the baptism of Jesus, is the mo most uh, momentous moment in the Gospel of Matthew. Let's see if we can find out why. So every week I pray for uh, evidence, an example of the scripture that's coming for Sunday. Where are people being transfigured? Or another way to say it is, where do I see people who are changing. They once were this, but now they are that. Same person, but entirely different. And then uh, yesterday, I got up early, and I'm watching the TV, and I see this. Anybody watch it? Did you? A guy who was a prince is now a king. And how about that crown, huh? I mean, wow. And I'm watching the pageantry of this, and I'm comparing the liturgy of Westminster Abbey to Munger. In 1,500, 2,000 more years, we're going to be just like them. We're going to have the robes and the people who stand just there and read this, the bells that rang, all that. I'm going, my goodness, what a... What an ordeal, and the planning, and the budget, and it's like, wow, oh my goodness. Here's the thing, though, when we're talking about transfiguration, keep the picture up. This family is nuts. <laughs> Am I wrong? I mean, this family is completely crazy and dysfunctional in ways that literally make the news. How screwed up is your life? It's probably not that bad. And, and here, here's what we take away. This is, this is the king and queen of England and their family. 
They have castles that they can strut through. They have some of the most impressive art and possessions. They have golden carriages that they can ride in. They have a nation that, as I'm watching this, adores them. I don't know why, but they do. And yet, in spite of all that, they're still completely jacked up. Aren't they? I mean, it's just mind-boggling. How can you have that much and be that unhappy? And there we go. There we go. You can have all that and be unhappy. You can be blessed beyond your wildest measure and yet be unsatisfied. Why? The answer is, we have to be transfigured. You and I need to be changed. And it's not that the person that we are is necessarily, quote unquote, bad. It's that the person that we are is broken. And there has to be a transfiguration within us in a very deep level, there has to be a restoration and a healing within us. Our hearts have got to be made right. And what I wonder is this, as I'm watching this, I even listened to, I guess now, King uh, Charles III say it. He said, I'm not here to have the nations serve me. I'm here to be a servant to the nations. Well, great. Great. And I pray that that happens. But servants don't dress like that. <laughs> servants don't live like that. We are here because in some way, <laughs> we are worshiping Jesus. And one of the phrases we use for him is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he is. But compare his life to the one we see around us. What do kings really look like? What do people of power really look like? Not by worldly standards, but by his. When Jesus has this transfiguration vision, this, it's laden with Old Testament connections. And I pray that some of them jumped out at you. When, when Jesus takes or appears, he's on a mountaintop. And that should just, every time we see a mountaintop, we should just stop and say, biblically, something significant's about to happen. Put up the Exodus verse. And so the two people who put uh, are appear with Jesus are Moses and Elijah. And this is from Exodus. You can just take a look at it yourself. But Moses went up on the mountain. In fact, he went up on mountaintops more than once. He saw faith, God face to face and lived, is what the scripture says about him. He received all of the law and the Ten Commandments directly from the Lord. He is the one who was the most complete revelation of God up until that time. He is the one who led Israel through the wilderness. He is the one who led folks who were lost to days that they could be found. And I'll tell you, they were not easy days. If you read the book of Exodus, if you haven't, you're about to later this year. Hang on for the wild ride. But Moses was the greatest leader that Israel had ever had. And in the transfiguration story in Matthew 17, the face that the light is surrounding is not his. It's Christ's. If we could take it a bit further, the other person that appears in this, this sort of trinity of images is Elijah. He would have been considered the greatest of the prophets that Israel had ever had. If you want another wild ride in Scripture, read some of Elijah and you'll be stunned. The truth is, is that as you look at ancient manuscripts where Elijah is mentioned, Elijah over the centuries has been edited down. He's been toned down in what he said because he was so provocative in his preaching. The Israeli king of the time, Ahab, called him troublemaker. Every time he saw him, Troublemaker, what have you come to do with us? Troublemaker, what have you come to start now? Troublemaker, you know, I used to call my son this when he was 13. Here comes trouble, you know, I don't know what hormones in charge today, but okay, okay, 
You know, that's the relationship that he had, Elijah did, with the kings of Israel. But he was always the one who spoke truth to them. He ends up in a contest with the prophets of Baal, and they go up on this mountain. The prophets of Baal are trying to summon the Lord to consume the offering that they have provided. And then Elijah stands and watches. And as they beat themselves, as they dance, as they prance, as they petition, nothing happens. And then Elijah, just to taunt them, he starts pouring water all around his offering, the bull that he's got there, just pouring it water to make it harder for God to do. And then Elijah says, go, and then all of a sudden, boop, pshh, gone. The prophets flee. The one true God appears again. Elijah is that guy. And in the transfiguration of Jesus, Elijah appears slightly below him. The point of the story is simple and yet complicated. The truth of the story, the transfiguration, is a vision. It's a vision of what God is doing and is about to do. It's showing a future that's about to unfold. And to say it simply in language that we would use today, it's to say this, Jesus is number one. He is the greatest revelation of God. He is the one who has everything at his disposal. Everything that God has been doing is leading to Jesus. Everything that God will do from that moment onwards will focus around him. Jesus Christ is number one. And the implicit question that comes from this story is very simple. Is he with you? Is he priority number one? Or is he something else? And what the transfiguration moment in Matthew's gospel is telling us is that he is meant to go first. And so if you and I are living a life where Christ is not first, that needs to be fixed. And you will find all the things that you are looking for. You will discover what genuine wealth is. You will discover what genuine purpose is. You will discover what it is that you were created by God to do. Not when you put yourself first, not when you put your wealth first, not when you put your fame first, but when you put him first. When Jesus comes in as priority number one, really? That's when life begins to move. And I would encourage you today to make that choice for the first time or as a follower of Jesus again. Because it's something that, again, simple message, but living it out is the real kicker, isn't it? To make sure that Jesus Christ genuinely is in the way I've lived today, in the way I've lived this week, in the way I'm going to live next week, truly, truly, priority Number one. So I've got an exercise for you. You can do this. I want you to, uh, uh, I don't don't know how your house works, but our house could not work without post-it notes. Can't. Could not. We were born in the age of post-it notes because that's how our house works. And uh, about every other day, I get my list. Here are the things that you are going to do today. Thus saith the Lord through your lovely wife right? Did any of the other guys get this list, or am I just the only one here? Anybody? Anybody get a list? Yeah, okay. I'm praying for you. (laughs) So, so take, get up 15 minutes early. Sometime this week. Get up 15 minutes early. Get your Bible out. Go to the Munger website, do the reading plan, pick a devotional of your own. But somewhere in that, take the post-it note and write down your top five according to the values you think you are living today. In reality. Like I look at this last week. I look at my calendar. I think back to the conversations I've had. What are your top five? And make a list. Then flip it over. And what would you think Jesus would have your top five be? And spend some time in prayer, but not so much maybe petitioning the Lord, but listening. And listening and say, Lord, speak to me. 
What are my top five? You see, the transfiguration story is a vision. It's a revelation. And, and we don't talk about visions in Scripture very much in the American church because I think we're kind of afraid of them. But, but this is a vision. And, and remember that the, the people watching this unfold, this transfiguration moment, are Peter and James and John, three of the disciples. And so the purpose of this vision is not for Jesus himself. He knows who he is. The receivers of the vision are intended to be Peter, James, and John. What Jesus is hoping for is that not he will be changed. He knows who he is. But that they will. And then all of a sudden, did you remember in Scripture when it says, you know, all of a sudden everybody comes to, everybody sort of, you know, emerges from the vision, and, and, and the disciples are terrified. I bet they are. And what does Jesus reach out and do? He reaches out and touches them. And that's such a bad translation. He, he reaches out, he puts their hand on his shoulder, and they, he lifts them up. And he says, it's okay. And then I have to think somewhere along the line, he says, this is who you're going to be. The people whose faces are going to shine are yours. Peter, James, and John, the people who are going to do the healing are yours. You're going to do this. This is who you're going to be. And so when you do your top five, make your list of how you're living, but then make your list of who you think Christ is calling us to be. And then what would it take this week to make that flip? To take what's number one and move it down, or maybe get it rid off the list together altogether. And to really put Jesus first this week. But it's when we make those changes that we realize that the purpose of Jesus coming is not so that he can be transfigured, but that we can. That's the goal. And so let that change happen. Let that movement happen. But you're going to have to spend some time, and I am too, in all honesty comparing who we are now to who Christ is calling us to be. And where we see that gap, make that change. That's the purpose of the transfiguration story. I got a text a couple weeks ago from a Mungarian. And I, and I have to tell you, you all are an interesting lot of folks. I mean, some of you send the longest texts, or texts I've ever received. I mean, there are books of the Bible shorter than some of the texts that I've gotten. But I read them. I read them. But I got, I got a text from a Mungarian made me laugh. And, and she said, I'm always part of the Munger miracle. I'm never on time. I'm always 15 minutes late. She said, I've always been 15 minutes late to Munger. I've been 15 minutes late this Sunday. I'm always going to be 15 minutes late. And I said, I said to myself, no, you're not. <laughs> so I, I texted her back. I said, what would it take for you to be 14 minutes late? What would it take? What would it take to be 14 minutes late? And she said, well, I'd have to get up earlier. I said, do it. In the name of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A divine command to you. I love texts. They're so great. So the next Sunday, I didn't even know who this person was because it wasn't, it wasn't a number on my phone, so I didn't have a name. The next week, next Sunday, I'm standing out there greeting people, watching the Munger miracle happen. And, and all of a sudden, I get this tap on my shoulder. It's like, she said, it's 14 minutes before church. And I said, there you go. Change, change can happen. In another 13 months, she's going to be an on-time Mungarian. You know, I am looking forward to this unbelievable work of God. But here's, here's sort of the myth I think we live under. We, 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 we live under this myth that somehow Jesus is going to be priority number one without real change. And what you're really doing is, if you ask for that, is you're asking for the Lord to bless your sinful self as you are. That's not what Jesus came to do. He didn't came to say, broken's okay. He came to say, broken I can work with, broken I can heal, broken I can bring together again. There are all sorts of things we can do. But brokenness as a status quo is not what Jesus came to address. He came to fix it. And so, so you and I are going to, you know, as we make this list, this five as I am, this five as calling as Christ is calling me to be, there's going to have to be some real work there. And all I can encourage you is do it. Let the transfiguration happen. And as you do, 
Parts of it will be challenging. Parts of it may be painful. But a lot of it's going to be fun in the sense that you're going to look at the person you are, living for Christ, changed by his image, and you're going to like that person better than the person you are today. You know, we got a few folks who are going down to this Proverbs ministry, this prison ministry. And it's a tough thing. You know, I won't, I won't, it's tough. It's, it's emotional. I doubt many people who've been on it have ever been in prison before of, of any kind. When was the last time you talked to an inmate? Hmm? That's what this is going to do. It's going to put you in that room where conversations happen. And I guarantee you this. The inmates will leave changed. They'll be transfigured. The families, the kids who get to reconnect with, with dad is going to be highly moving to see. They're going to be changed. But there's a third transfiguration that's going to happen. And you know who it is. And so my question to you is, are you willing to be that kind of person? To put yourself in that space so that the Spirit can do its thing. I would encourage you, pray about that, pray about something like that. Serve in some way, because when we really are the servants, it's just amazing how the Spirit begins to move. I will assure you that I'm no better at this than you are, and I have as much work, if not more, to do on me than the rest of you. And I get uh, fall into ruts, I get discouraged, I get, you know, think, oh my gosh, it's always going to be this way, and uh, the other day I was on my Peloton, I decided to do a 45-minute ride, and I, I'm on this, that's not funny, the funny part's coming, but thank you. <laughs> Priming the crowd. I also have to say, you all are much funnier than the 11 o'clock service. I, I have not unlocked that crowd. If some of you could come at 11, that would be awesome. The yeast that could, have, you know, infect the whole batch. Anyway, what about Peloton? So, so I'm like 17 minutes into this 45-minute thing, and, and, and I feel terrible. It's like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die right here on this bike. Deborah is going to come pry me off. I'm going to meet Jesus on my bike, which I guess that's okay, but that's not really how I envision this going down. And so I'm thinking about quitting. Let's just quit. Just quit. Just stop. Just stop. That evil voice. Just stop. It'll be so easier. Just stay as you are. And so I don't know where this came from, but obviously, you know, the Peloton, if you don't know, it's got a live instructor. You can do pre-recorded stuff too, but live instructor. And Matt Wilpers is a guy named one of them. I really like this guy. I want to meet him someday. And so I decide that instead of listening to the evil voice within me that says, quit, go make a mimosa. Go, <laughs> you know, go, go have some potato chips. You know, that voice, I said, I'm not, not going to listen to that voice. And I said, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to focus on the instructor. I'm just going to focus, and I'm going to do everything he says. And I did. And it wasn't easy. I didn't enjoy it. But 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, 20 minutes later, I'm going to finish this. And the reason it happened is because I decided to stop listening to me and start listening to him. You see where we're going. Make your, your five as you are. Make your five as you think Christ would want you to be. And when you see that and the difference between the two, you may well say, I just don't know how I can do that. He does. And the reason we put him number one is because he knows the way. And that involves some humility on our part because it involves a confession that we don't. So just the thing about this scripture passage today is it it puts us in our place. We're not Moses. We're not Elijah. We're certainly not Jesus. But the glorious thing about it, and it's true for all three, really, but it's, it's by far and away mostly true for him, is that in that vision, there is an invitation for us to become like him. And that is what Jesus and the twelve are working, that's what the church is doing today, is to encourage us, you and me, to accept that invitation and let that transfiguration occur 
in you. Pray with me. Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for this morning. We ask that you would be with us as we celebrate who you are. Lord, you are King of kings. (laughs) You are Lord of lords. And yet in all your power and privilege, you are nothing but the most humble, the most gracious, and the most serving. We pray that you would be with us today. Help us to put ourselves in your place so that we might become more like you. All this we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And as God's people, we say together, amen. Amen.